Hi, everyone. Yes. No, it's fine. We'll get started in in just a few minutes. We're just waiting for some more people to join. Are you saying hi? Whoa, there's a lot of Oh, people. hi, oh God, Paco. Hi, Ed. <laughs> we miss you so much. Oh, Paco. <laughs> a lot of good familiar faces. Hi, Dan. Can. <laughs> so fun. Wow. Hi, guys. Hi. Oh. Hey, El. <laughs> this is great. Paco, you're really tan. I feel like my face is just red. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, uh, my goggle tan. <laughs> mm. Oh, Trisha message. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is so fun. Um. If there's a way, hey Lauren. Hey. Do you know if there's a way to just let people come in so I don't have to admit them? Yeah, you would think then so. I... There's a setting on the internet. I'll see if I can change it on our admin side. Cool. Because right now I have to admit, I think each person <laughs> individually. Right. That is a little silly. Hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and you also have the power to mute people or whatever you need to, Aaron, as a as an ad as a leader. Okay, I will wield the power responsibly. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks everyone. We'll we'll wait just a couple more minutes here. There's there's a few people that we're trying to admit them that are still joining. And then let's say we'll start in in either way in three minutes we'll get we'll get going. So Aaron, I like your headset. It's very stylish. You like my what? Headset. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Yeah, I uh this was my big, you know, COVID investment was getting a a nice headset for all of the video work that we do now. <laughs> so it it has a um the microphone is apparently like noise canceling, so if I'm in like a noisy area works pretty well. Oh. <laughs> okay, Aaron, I made the change, but I don't know if it's the right change. Hopefully I just enabled people to join before the host, and so that might give permission. Um, I guess we'll have to see. And I don't know if it's recording anymore, if you happen to be able to record on your screen. If not, I'll figure something out. I, yeah, I think it says recording, so it should be oh. good. All right, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and share share my screen then and get started. And I think hopefully people are able to just join and I won't have to admit. So let's see here. Okay, great. So we'll go ahead and get started. And today we're going to talk a little bit about positive psychology and specifically around how we can put some of the research and, and uh, findings from that field into practice in our own lives. So 
the first the first half or so of the presentation is going to talk more a little bit of background about positive psychology which will have hopefully some good helpful insights as well and then from there we'll talk a little bit more about some kind of practical tools that that people can implement so we'll kind of go through that progression and feel free to if you have a question you can just type it in the chat and you can interrupt you don't have to hold your questions till the end i'd love for people to participate it's still definitely a new thing for me to to do these kind of webinar series where it's harder to kind of have interaction with folks so um you know that's i appreciate the interaction so you know anytime you want go ahead and, and chime in with 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 questions or comments and those sorts of things and let me just make sure okay and i think you should be able to unmute yourself okay there's still people coming in here okay so this is part of the dragons global speaker series which we before coronavirus stuff would do in classrooms and come into different schools and just offer free talks about um, themes that our different educators are passionate about and so this is actually a talk a modified version of a talk that I've given at schools before and also have given with our own our own staff for for training purposes that's me is there can everyone see the screen I'm sharing I hope so I'm just I can see it from Lauren okay thanks Lauren all right so just a little bit of introduction for those who who I haven't met before I'm the director of student programming at dragons and I've I've been with Dragon since 2008, so coming around on on 12 years now. And I've started as an instructor, and I've led over 10 courses, primarily in Latin America and Indonesia. Um, I think Indonesia is still probably my favorite place to visit. I've been going there every year for the last decade, so it's a place that's pretty near and dear to my heart. And then I started studying positive psychology about 10 years ago kind of on a whim i uh i a, a friend actually recommended a book on the topic it was by herbert benson who's he's a he's an md from harvard who does a lot of kind of more on on wellness studies and like proactive wellness care and i thought that was really interesting like how do people mac maximize their physical well-being and then from that it kind of moved me into the kind of positive psychology of looking at how people maximize their emotional and mental well-being as well um, so there was at one point a friend uh, stayed at, stayed at my house and I was out of town and I had about like 12 different books on positive psychology on my bedside stand and he called me and said hey I just want to check in and make sure you know everything's all right I'm not sure if you're depressed or what's going on I said no just just curious about the topic so um, anyways I I over the last you know five or six years I've kind of taken what was kind of a personal project and try to think about ways to adapt it into experiential education and the work that we do primarily with students um, and, and with our instructors. And so thinking about how it actually can inform the activities that we get to do. So a little sneak preview of what we're gonna cover. We're gonna start off talking about the why of positive psychology and thinking a little bit about the field, how it came about, uh, what, what really are kind of some of the main goals and and points of focus for for the field we're going to talk a little bit about the negativity bias and why that is foundational as a as a motivating factor for positive psychology it's it's kind of pretty intimately related to the why uh, understanding those kind of innate tendencies that we have within ourselves we're going to look at some different definitions of happiness and when the word happiness gets thrown on a lot especially i think in pop culture there's so much talk of happiness studies and all these different kind of self-help books around how to be happier and so kind of maybe unpack that a little bit from uh you know which are, are completely useful and helpful you know topics of exploration around happiness studies but kind of unpacking that from positive psychology which is which kind of has a, a bit more of a defined definition of when we're talking about happiness what we're talking about and then we're going to kind of use this framing of the happiness formula 
which is kind of a, a fun and interesting way of looking at the different kind of main factors that go into helping to de determine our well-being. And then we're going to end in looking at some different practices and some helpful tools. So that's kind of the sneak preview of where we're headed. All right, so why positive psychology? I think a common myth is that positive psychology is just this kind of head in the sand, rose colored glasses, optimism. And I think, you know, that critique is, is I understand where it comes from, of course, because I think we always can run the risk of, of trying to put a positive spin and find the silver lining in anything into a, into a place where we actually diminish the value of pain and suffering. And I think positive psychology actually looks at pain and suffering in the world as completely integral to the positive aspects. So it really is the yin and yang. So it's not just about ignoring those things and, and just kind of trying to find the lightness and everything. Uh, I think we all know that adversity and suffering are really fundamental facts of life and in Buddhism kind of the, the first tenet of life is, is, is suffering is something that I think we all experience in different, in different ways. And so, you know, positive psychology is not about ignoring or putting rose colored glasses on that adversity and suffering, but rather thinking about how, how do we respond? And even when things are outside of our control and outside of our circumstances, which feels so relevant right now when so little feels within our control in terms of, the local and global situation and just our the limitations that we're all facing right now and the different struggles what still remains in terms of our own self-efficacy in terms of our own power to still have some ownership and accountability to our own happiness and that it, it doesn't become something that's completely dependent on our surroundings and circumstances so that's a kind of a primary motivation behind the field and then when we do face adversity and struggle, how can we amplify the good and then use the bad as opportunities for learning and for improving moving forward in the future? Um, and then this last point, which we kind of already touched around, but really positioning ourselves as a spring, a, a kind of internal, a, a eternal spring for our own happiness and well-being. And if we can do that and not make it reliant on a specific relationship. Hey, can I ask or, you a question? I'm trying to do my, my shoe thing, but I need you to be here. Yes. What's that? Oh. You might just, sorry, might just mute some folks. So that last point I think is is especially important just around it's not it's not about independence and this kind of this idea that our happiness is is your own journal journey because the research really shows uh that more than anything one of the most most potent predictors and influences on our happiness is our relationships. So we'll talk a little about how important our social networks are and the people that we surround ourselves and how we spend our time is really integral. So sourcing our own happiness doesn't mean that we go live in a cave and cut ourselves off from our community. Um, it, it means that when things don't go as is ex expected, that we have some internal resilience and some ways uh, of empowerment and choosing that how we, how we respond to those things. So in addition to kind of framing and in, in, uh, as a way of approaching life in a, a positive frame, it also has really tangible benefits. So more than just this kind of abstract notion of it's something that helps us just feel good all the time, it's also, it's also a, has very real physiological and, and emotional benefits. So there's I'm not going to get into all, we just don't have time to get into all these different studies, but there's amazing research out there about how different uh, positive mindsets and 
positive positivity practices can actually improve work performance, quality of life, mental acuity, uh, all the all these things, resiliency, self-esteem, creativity. Um, one one study that I really enjoyed was about a team of doctors where they were doing their rounds with their patients, and before they did their rounds, these were these were attendees in, in training. Uh, they primed them with these either negative or kind of positive primers. So I think they use actually like YouTube videos. And for one group, they had them watch something that was uh, kind of upsetting and negative and, you know, dark and kind of angry uh, videos that would kind of be a little bit upsetting. And then in the other, I think they had them watch like kitten videos or something like that. It was just kind of universally happy and light. And then they sent them out to do their rounds. And they found that the people that had this positive primer were around 20 to 30 percent, not just not just uh, happier in terms of their performance, but were more efficient, were more accurate in their diagnoses. Were you know the patient care was better. It was kind of every level, every metric that they would use to to ex to examine kind of terms of their performance was improved. And you know we know that also that stress and negative mental states actually physiologically increase the cortisol and stress levels in our brain, which can impair, uh, put us in that kind of fight or flight response, which can be good in some situations, but in our daily lives, being in that kind of a stressed, anxious state is actually not beneficial towards our health or kind of our daily, meeting the daily needs of our lives. So we talked a little about the brain actually performs better in those states. So getting into kind of the, the why of positive psychology, if we have this little chart here where a one is essentially, we're talking about a one being um, really, really deep depression. Um, you know, this is a place that is, is very dark. Uh, you know, you can't get out of bed, can't function. So a one is, is not a good place to be in. And a 10 is kind of the happiest that you can imagine yourself, the you know, high point of of your life like this this is the best that you everything's going well and then a five is kind of what we'll just call a quote-unquote normal but just that kind of functioning normal baseline state and psychology historically has looked at people that are down in this kind of two and threes and ones people that are suffering from depression and anxiety and unhappy relationships and really having you know major struggles and, and just functioning on a daily basis, it's looked at how can we bring those people from those lower numbers up to this kind of normalcy functioning state. So that's really what that kind of the, the field of psychology has has focused on. And um, Martin Seligman, who's kind of known as the the founder of the field of psychology, he's at University of Pennsylvania and now runs uh, a really interesting center there called the Center for Authentic Happiness. But when he was founding the field in the 1990s, it's been around for about 30 years now, he, he did a survey of research in psychology and found that for every 17 studies that had to do with some type of negative characteristic, there was only one that had anything to do with a positive characteristic. And he kind of thought, wow, this is, this is an interesting lens that everything is focused on kind of disorder and lack of functioning rather than, than looking at what's going on with thriving. Um, when people are really succeeding and so you know that's that's what positive psychology kind of came back let's let's not just look at the people that are below this kind of baseline but let's look at how can we take people from a five up to, oh, up to these higher uh levels of like a, a sevens and eights and nines and let's look at people that are reporting really high like life satisfaction and at work and positive relationships uh and just like positive affect in all these different regards and and what's going on with those folks and what can we what can we learn from them and emulate in our own lives so that's kind of the basis of, of where the field first came about if i'm pausing it's because i'm i'm still kind of trying to admit people as they trickle in here so the negativity bias The way that we evolved is 
is with this really strong threat detection and survival instinct. So if you think about historically that we, you know, as a species have, have, been, have been taught to very quickly d determine and seek out potential threats for, in order to survive. Uh, so a classic example of kind of walking around the street and looking for a predator that might be lurking in the bushes uh, around the corner. And that, you know, maybe a hundred times you're wrong that there's no, you know, there's no tiger that's, that's going to, that's going to eat you, but it's better to be wrong a hundred, hundred times and react than, you know, that one time have a tiger there and not react and then, and then you're done. And so what we've, what we've honed is these really, really heightened senses for detecting threats. And it, it just doesn't serve us in the same way as it did millennia ago when life was a really different landscape. I think for most people, and you know, of course, I don't want to generalize for everyone, but I think for a lot of people that are on this Zoom call and they're able to do that, that you're probably not facing an immediate physical threat where that that type of threat detection, that heightened anxiety of, of, of survival instinct is kind of upon you all the time. So the way that it manifests now is that we're continually scanning for threats, but we're often looking for threats that either don't exist, they're not there, or they are amplified to a point that is, is so outside of what's actually proportional to what's happening. And so, you know, you think about going to a if you go to a party um, back in the days when we could all go to actual <laughs> human to human parties and you enter the room and you, you look around the room and everyone's hey hey Aaron and, and smiling at you and waving but there's one person in the corner that kind of looks at you and gives you this this kind of dirty look or kind of what is this person doing here it makes you doesn't make you feel very good and maybe for the rest of the night you know that's all you focus on is that one that one look, that one kind of threat that you perceived in that person, even though the other 20 people at the party were kind of smiling and waving at you. So our way of remembering things is, is heavily weighted to those threats and to the point where it can actually overshadow the positive things. So when we talk about the negativity bias in the context of positive psychology, we're talking about the need to actually counteract that negativity proactively because it's, it's so strong and, and so deeply ingrained. And not only, you know, the Tetris effect is, this, if, for those who grew up playing Tetris like I did, it's this game where you have the falling pieces and you've, if you played it long enough, you kind of would start to close your eyes and you'd see the Tetris pieces on the back of your eyelids. And then if you played it even longer, when you're walking around outside, you might see a lamp post and think, oh, that looks like one of these long pieces that I could place here. Or you might see a couch that you can turn upside down and you start to actually see the Tetris pieces in your daily life. And so part of the psychologists that have kind of come up with this term, the Tetris effect, which refers to essentially uh, how we're seeing these threats and these negative patterns that maybe don't actually exist. So we're projecting because we become so practiced at this threat detection and at, at kind of seeking that out that we actually start to see those shapes, those negative threat shapes uh, in our surroundings when they're not there. And so what we wanna do with the positive side of that is to actually train ourselves to start to look for those same positive um, patterns that exist out there too. Because just as we can train ourselves to look for threat detection, we can also do that in a way that helps us uh, look for, for positive things out there too. Cultural negativity, I think this is something that we're all pretty intimately familiar. You turn on, you turn on the news and it, you know, 90 plus percent of it is negative stories. It's, it's what we're, it's what we flock to. It's what, uh, dominates the conversation is is kind of our fascination with negative news and stories and i think this kind of example of sean sean aker who wrote a book called the happiness advantage and some other books uh, he's he teaches at harvard and and talked about when he first started there they had a student orientation and their student orientation had a wellness week as part of their like on-campus orientation and this is what the wellness week was on day one, Monday was about eating disorders. 
Tuesday, depression. Wednesday, drug abuse. And Thursday, sexual assault and risky sex. So even the way that we're talking about wellness in our society is still from this negative mindset of not proactive care of what are we doing to, to nurture and flourish these you know, positive components of ourselves, but rather risk avoidance, risk mitigation. Um, it's scary. It's, it's still in the negative frame, even when it's something as kind of ostensibly positive as, as wellness week. So the Pygmalion effect, uh, it's kind of actually a weird story. I don't, I don't, Robert Rosenthal is a psychologist who kind of termed this and he did a really fascinating study that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it's kind of the actual myth as most Greek myths are, are, are kind of strange. So don't read too much into the name. Although I did include the Pygmalion uh, kind of painting here. So we're going to try listening to, it's a five minute segment from the radio show This American Life and I hope this is going to work to where you all will be able to hear the story. So this is about five minutes and, and then we'll come back and, and kind of talk about how this relates to positive psychology. Uh oh, are people not hearing? Uh oh, sorry everyone. Okay, well, that was unfortunate. Hmm. Let's see, that might be because you're using your headphone. Uh, okay, let me try that and we'll let me just recalibrate here. Sorry about that. I didn't see all the messages coming in. I thought it was working. Let's see if I can just change my audio and then we'll go. Let's see if this works this time. Tell that story. I'm joined here at the studio by Dan Wilson, one of the lead speakers. Dan is very much a true bio of fact. Why did you start your career as a doctor in D.C.? Well, you always loved it. I did. And where did it lead? Bring the red, too. We ferreted it into a little kind of edit booth type thing. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Type office. And we okay. invited people. I'm not sure if this is going to work, unfortunately, with the... Oh, I can hear. Oh, it is working. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your patience. Uh, I will start it over. It's a five-minute clip here, so hopefully we got it figured out. So today we have a story that we think might make you believe something that right now you do not believe. And to tell that story, I'm joined here in the studio by NPR science reporters Elise Spiegel and Lula Miller. Hey there, guys. Hi. Hello. And do I have this right? So you bought a rack and you brought it to NPR headquarters in Washington, D.C.? Elise, Elise bought the rack. I did. And where at NPR did you bring the rack to?
we ferreted it into a little kind of edit booth type thing. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Type office. And we invited people into the room one by one. So can you just describe what we got here? It's a rat. Pinkish ears. Great eyes. Long nose. And sat them down in front of this rat and asked this question. Do you think that the thoughts that you have in your head Okay, the private thoughts that you have in your head could influence how that rat moves through space? No. 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 And it was almost unanimous. No. People did not believe that their personal thoughts would have any effect on the rat at all. Because that would suggest some sort of telepathy, which I don't have. And Ira, maybe that's what you think too. That is what I think. I don't think that people thinking thoughts will affect a rat's behavior. Well, you're wrong. No. <laughs> yes. Okay, so who's this? This is a man named Bob Rosenthal. He's a research psychologist. And early in his career, he did this thing. He went into his lab late at night and hung signs on all of the rat cages. And some of the signs said that the rat in the cage was incredibly smart. And so... and record how well it does. Can you just pick up the rat? Early in his career, he did this thing. He went into his lab late at night and hung signs on all of the rat cages. And some of the signs said that the rat in the cage was incredibly smart. And some of the signs said that the rat in the cage was incredibly dumb, even though neither of those things was true. They were very average rats that you would buy from a research institute that sells rats for a living. So then Bob brings this group of experimenters into his lab and he says, for the next week, some of you are gonna get these incredibly smart rats and some of you are gonna get these incredibly stupid rats. And your job is to run your rat through a maze and record how well it does. Can you just pick up the rat? So I, we actually did a very low fi unscientific version of this in that little room in NPR. They let you do that? We didn't ask permission. Is that okay to do? Yeah. yeah. And you've probably already guessed where this is going. Yeah, in Bob's real study, the experimenters ran the rats that they'd been told were smart. She's sort of an intelligent looking face. And the rats they'd been told were dumb. Yeah, he seems kind of, you know, lazy. It was not even close. The results were so dramatic. In Bob's real study, the smart rats did almost twice as well as the dumb rats. Wait, even though they were the same? Yeah, even though the smart rats were not smart and the dumb rats were not dumb. They were all just the same average kind of lab rat. It was so shocking, people didn't really believe him. I was having trouble publishing any of this. And so what was going on? Like, like what was actually happening to make the rats do this? So what Bob figured out was that the expectations that the experimenters carried in their heads subtly changed the way that the experimenters touched the rats and that changed the way that the rats behaved. So when the experimenters thought that the rats were really smart, they felt more warmly towards the rats and so they touched them more gently. We do know that handling rats and handling them more gently can actually perf uh, increase the performance of rats. And how does this play out when it comes to people? How do our expectations of other people work? Well, what you saw in the rats totally holds for people too. I talked to Carol Dweck, who's a psychologist and researcher at Stanford. You may be standing farther away from someone you have lower expectations for. You may not be making as much eye contact. And it's not something you can put your finger on. We're not usually aware of how we are conveying our expectations to other people, but it's there. And it happens in all kinds of areas. Research has shown that a teacher's expectations can raise or lower a student's IQ score, that a mother's expectations influences the drinking behavior of her middle schooler, that military trainers' expectations can literally make a soldier run faster or slower. So my question was, you know, how far does this go? So Carol, clearly these expectation effects exist on a continuum. So for example, if I right. expect that if 
you know, somebody jumps off a building, they will be able to fly. That's not going to work out so well, right? Mm -hmm. So what does science know about where we should draw the line? Does it have a clear sense of that? No. That line is moving. As we come to understand things that are possible and mechanisms through which a belief affects an outcome or one person affects another person, that line can move. Of WBEC Chicago, it's This American Life. Okay. All right, hopefully. Hopefully that worked. I was getting <laughs> messages that people could hear it. So hopefully that was the case. Um, I love that clip. The whole episode is actually fantastic. Um, definitely worth listening to. It's called Batman the episode, but it's episode 544. If you're curious to listen to the whole story. Um, but, you know, I think the reason why I wanted to highlight that story, because I think it does that in a fun way with, with the rats, is that mindset really matters and and we often think about our own positivity or negativity as our own business and 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 it is of course you know that that it's an internal state and but the reality is that um the way that we project on the others and our expectations and our internal state actually has tangible impacts in the world and our surroundings and i think that's a really powerful powerful finding because it, it shows that this is actually something that's not just about us. It's actually about our community and about the people that we surround ourselves with. And I think to me, that's actually a lot more powerful than just this kind of self pursuit of happiness, that there's actually a benefit in this for, for our entire community and, and how we're kind of looking at that. Um, and you know, this, the study that, that Rosenthal did about giving, they did the, he did the, exactly the same thing with, with students in a classroom uh, where he basically had the, these students administer um, tests telling them that the teacher that one group was a smart group of students, the other one was kind of the less smart group of students. And the same thing as the rats, the group that was the smart group, quote unquote, performed better even though they were randomly selected. And so I just, I just think of if our behaviors can influence rats through these like tone of voices and the way we're touching them or all these different subtle ways just imagine the kind of myriad ways that we're communicating our expectations and mindsets to others around us as kind of on the human to human level and this idea of kind of networks of negativity and positivity there was a really interesting 20 year, this massive, it was part of this long study at, at Harvard Medical School with involving over 5,000 participants. And what they actually found was just in the same ways, it's kind of weird talking about this now given the, the pandemic, but they actually had epidemiologists that actually looked at happiness and depression and how it clusters in communities in the same way that they can actually track disease. So epidemiologists were actually able to look and see that the way that people were reporting their levels of well-being and happiness um, or levels of depression and anxiety was actually in these different clusters of communities, which all kind of is in line with what we know that are the people, the company that we keep matters and the people that are around us have a huge impact on our own, our own well-being for better or for worse. And so that's just the reality of our importance of community. And I think, you know, that, that our reality is very dynamic and, and co-created. Uh, when you look at actually the, the whole field of consciousness studies and how, how ne neuroscientists look at the development of consciousness, uh, it's, it's an open loop system. So, you know, the way that we form our identity and our boundaries is in this constant dialogue with our surroundings, which is kind of one of the reasons why meditation or prayer or chanting from a spiritual perspective can have these really powerful outcomes because they close off the external stimulus, the external stimuli that's kind of coming in and defining our boundaries. And it's the same way with our moods, that our moods are constantly in this dialogue with our surroundings. So it's a bit of an illusion to just think of ourselves as these kind of completely independent creatures. So moving into kind of how we actually define happiness, these are, 
just a few kind of standard definitions that I, that I, I kind of like. And one comes from just Webster D Dictionary, which is just a state of well-being and contentment, joy, a pleasurable or satisfying experience. I think that a lot of us can relate to that as a kind of common definition of happiness. Aristotle had this nice phrase of the joy we feel striving after our potential. So this idea that happiness is this ongoing pursuit of our greater selves, of our ideals, of kind of our potential uh, selves. And Sean Aker, uh, I like this one too, pleasure combined with deeper feelings of meaning and purpose. Happiness implies a positive mood in the present and a positive outlook for the future. And then in terms of how positive psychologists in the field are talking about the term of happiness, there's so many different definitions that you can't really mark someone's, uh, their metric of happiness. You can't put that against someone else's because it's so subjective. And so what they talk about is what is the subjective experience of well-being? What is your self-reported state of well-being? And so when we talk about the word happiness, which we kind of sub in, cause it's, it's just, it's such a common phrase that we talk about in most of the research, they're actually self-reported well-being is what we're looking at. So I think thinking about your own relationship with happiness, that word, you know, thinking about what, what are the things that, how, how you define that in your life and, and thinking beyond just a dictionary definition, but what are the components of your happiness? What are the things that are necessary for that? And those might be family or, or good food or, you know, um, security and these basic needs of happiness to the things that are maybe more beyond just uh, a kind of baseline state of contentment to more when you feel like you're really embodying happiness in a different way. I think it's a really good activity to come back. And if we had a more dynamic interface, I'd love to actually like have people share out these different definitions. But I think for now, just kind of take that as a prompt that you can think about on your own of just like, what are those, what are the components of your own happiness? How would you define that? And how would you kind of come up with a definition that you can come back to maybe when you're struggling or feeling down um, to be able to come back to, to, to this definition and revisit it. Cause often when we're in those kind of dark corridors, it can be really hard to see the light. And so it's helpful to have a, a you know, a page in your journal or something that you can come back to and look and remember, Oh, these are the things that make me happy. Um, and, and remind yourself of that. In the field, some of the key components that of happiness that have been identified is this idea of optimism. And when we think of optimism and kind of come and speak, it's usually it's usually the notion of, of hopefulness, almost used interchangeably, like a hopefulness for the future. In the field, it's, it's this idea that your behavior actually has impacts in your surroundings. So being optimistic means that your choices and actions matter and that the things can change that you have efficacy. So it's kind of an interesting different definition of how we commonly think of optimism. Social connection, the breadth and depth of our relationship, it's kind of already become a theme of our talk is about community and how important that is. Perspective, how do we respond to adversity? Do we see, do we see a, a threat as something that is actually a threat to our own sense of identity and security and well-being and who we are in the world? Or do we see that as a challenge, as a challenge that we can learn from, that we can overcome, that can become you know, transformed into something else, some type of opportunity? So the perspective that we have on the things that we face, that's a, a really key component of kind of a, a healthy level of well-being. And then this final one, meaning. I really like this one because it's about alignment and resonance of your own values and actions. So it's great to think about family is important to me and family matters, but what are the choices in your life that are helping you to embody those values? If you embody kindness and compassion, is that something that just lives in an abstract state of your mind? Or is that something that you embody in daily rituals or in the street with strangers or by volunteering or by the way that you treat your colleagues or friends? Um, so really meaning 
is when there's that alignment of our deeper core values, those things that we believe in and hold to be true and purposeful in the world uh, and how we actually live those in our daily lives. And then this last, this last thing is kind of um, a bit of like an amalgamation of the above, but this is uh, the, called the PERMA model, which is a really common model in positive psychology, which is the core components are, they kind of have these five which they add accomplishments, but positive emotion, engagement, which is essentially social connection and relationships, which are kind of similar uh, intertwined. And then meaning, which we talked about. And then this last one, accomplishments, that actually feeling that, that you're accomplishing things in your daily life or that you're setting goals and that there's some kind of sense of, of momentum, um, they find that that, that that results in happiness for a lot of folks that they've they've looked at. So, moving into, oh, just want to make sure I'm not okay. The happiness formula. The happiness formula is something that Dr. Seligman, who his first kind of major book was called Learned Optimism, um, which is a really good read and. His second one was called Authentic Happiness, which I think is a be better introduction, actually, than Learned Optimism. But he came up with this thing called the happiness formula, which is basically based on his decades of research in the field that he said, okay, you can boil down happy happiness into these kind of core components. So what are those? He says happiness equals baseline. Now, what's, what's baseline? Baseline, sometimes also called biology, but that if you remember back to that chart that we had earlier where there's the one through the 10, we all float on some kind of baseline state internally that when we wake up in the morning, that some of us wake up and we're three, and some of us wake up and we're an eight or a nine. And I think we all know people that are kind of on different sides of that scale. And so that baseline state is kind of our our common mood or affect that we experience. Um, and that's, that's pretty deeply ingrained. That, that's actually, it's, it's hard to, to move your baseline state. There's a few things that you can do for that um, that have been you know, shown in the, in the literature to, to actually move your baseline state, but it, it's, hard, it's hard to do. And um, one of the major predictors of it, why it's often called biology is because one of the predictors of where you are on that scale, essentially, is your family, is your parents. And so how people's parents report their own well-being it has a very strong correlation with a child's own reporting. So whether that is because of actual genetics or maybe that is because of parenting style and because of patterns that are being repeated in a family, either positive or negative ones, they can be really deeply ingrained. They've done really interesting identical twin studies that have shown that you know across um, a, a identical twins that were kind of separated at birth and grew up in different areas, that they are incredibly similar, more similar than, than fraternal twins that grew up in the same household, actually, for things that are like depression, drug use, anxiety, religiosity. So a lot of these things are actually kind of related to this kind of baseline state. So a lot of people, when we talk about this, might have this reaction, which is, well, that doesn't feel fair. That feels like very restrictive and it feels like this thing is defining me. But you know, the reality is, is that none of us choose our parents and none of us cho chose how we were raised and you know, what things happened to us when we were children, uh, whether positive or negative, what traumas might have happened or occurred. Those are things that form who we are on these really deep levels and they're there. And so, you know, it's, it's something that we're gonna kind of leave at that point right now and kind of move on because it's actually really hard to move that baseline state. So the next thing is circumstances. Circumstances, especially in kind of the modern society of materialism and thinking about just kind of what we get in the media is the idea that happiness is found in your circumstances. If you make more money, you'll be happy. If you live in a certain area, you'll be happy. If you get this new phone, that's, that's where your happiness is. It's this idea that 
by changing our external surroundings that we that is where the key to happiness lies well what, what the research actually shows is that that's not that's not the case um, they've done these interesting studies of people that have won the lottery and after they won the lottery and came into you know tens of millions of dollars overnight and buy that yacht or whatever they wanted to do with it that after six to 12 months their their happiness did sh they did shoot up their happiness but after six to 12 months they were right back where they were before so if they were a three they were right back to a three so oh sorry Trevor, come back um so the idea that like the lottery would be the secret to the happiness i think we all know that intuitively but in our daily actions we maybe forget that it, it just hasn't been shown to be the case likewise with people that have experienced intense grief or, or, or loss um, the loss of a loved one, they find that that grief and that loss is, is still there and, and has a, actually takes a lot longer to get back to that baseline state, but that people do get back to that doesn't mean that you forget about the loss or the grief. It just means that people are able to kind of return to this new normal um, that resembles that baseline state. Another thing I'll say about circumstances is that we we don't have a lot of control over them. I think we, we think we do. And I'm speaking here like from a very real and personal experience with, with, with where there be dragons is that we were doing things were going really well with our programs. We we're really excited about a lot of things that were going on for 2020 and then boom, COVID-19 hits and everything changes, you know, within, within days or weeks, the whole outlook for all kinds of things just kind of flipped, turned on its head. And in a way that, you know, none of us saw that coming at, at Dragons. And so um, even though we do all this stuff to kind of kind of control and plan for these circumstances, in the end, life is, is crazy and, and kind of out of our control. So the final one is M for mindset. And mindset is really where the majority of the field of positive psychology focuses its attention because mindset is the area that we have the most efficacy. It's the area that uh, we have the most control over. We don't choose our parents. It's really hard to, to move that like baseline state on a fundamental level. Um, so, you know, baselines, it's a, it's a complicated thing to move. Circumstances, not the key to happiness and also limited, limited control of our circumstances. Uh, but mindset, the way that we respond to adversity, the way that we, we are under challenges, the way that we see um, threats and the way that we have perspective um, and the way that we celebrate successes, those are things that we actually do have access to regardless of the circumstances. So in a lot of ways, mindset is kind of the lowest hanging fruit for us individually to kind of have the highest return uh, in terms of our, our well-being and happiness. So what are some things that actually make up mindset? Mindset, we're talking about things like gratitude, not just our ability to feel gratitude, but our ability to express gratitude. Uh, learned optimism. People talk about optimism and pessimism as if they're fixed traits, when the reality is, is that we can move ourselves along that, along that spectrum of optimism and pe pe pessimism. And so how are we actually moving towards an area where we feel more empowered in our actions, that we have more influence over our own, our own lives. Healthy habit formation, things about where are the things within our circumstances, within our lives, where I do have some control to form intentional habits that I know are good for me. Maybe it's using technology less. Maybe it's having a morning routine when you wake up of meditation or exercise or you know, all these different things that are, what are these habits that we can actually make part of our daily lives? Savoring and celebration, I love this one. Uh, when you have a positive experience, how can you actually make that memory stick in the same way that these negative memories are, are more, they call it neurologically sticky, that those memories tend to last longer with us? That's um, How can we do that with with positive memories? How can we savor them and celebrate them so that they're more easily recalled down the road. Mindfulness and awareness, as we go through our daily lives, thinking about being more observant and mindful of what's happening to us, and that kind of brings us more present and brings us out of 
you know, anxiety, which is kind of a fear of the future and uh, depression, which is often kind of related to uh, trauma from the past. So how can we be more landed in the present? And then perspective, which we talked about is kind of responding to adversity. So this is a mindset model that, um, oh, let me just let some people in here. This is a mindset model that, sorry, here we go, that we teach on a lot of our Dragons courses. So for any past students of mine that are on the call or other Dragon students, you probably have seen this before, but I think it is a helpful way of kind of just thinking about, about mindset in general. So we call it the, the prisoner vacationer learner model. Um, and I think it's easily illustrated with kind of just a good a dragon's example from a home, homestay which is a really common thing that we see with students is that you come into a homestay let's say we're in guatemala and you have all these expectations about what the experience is going to be like so you're have this kind of really imagination of like this is what's going to it's going to feel like this is what it's going to look like and you get attached to that imagination of the of the experience and then when you actually get in the homestay maybe it's really different than what it was and so you thought you're going to be with a bunch of students and other siblings and that it was going to kind of be this festive atmosphere and when you actually get to the homestay it's just you and two elderly grandparents and it's quiet and it's not at all what you expected it's not the kind of rambunctious vibrant energy that you expected in that situation, the prisoner mindset is this idea where the potential for joy and the potential for learning is actually your, it's not possible anymore because your mindset is so locked in the negative that it actually holds you captive in terms of your ability to find the positive in the experience. And so in that mindset, what it looks like for that student is this is, this sucks. This is, you know, why did they put me in this homestay? Uh, everyone else has a better homestay. It's this kind of very comparative, negative, externalized way of looking at the experience. And it's really hard to escape that. And the way we say pirate is because often the kind of idea like misery loves company, that the prisoner quickly can turn into the pirate of actually hijacking the experience from others. And the vacationer is in that, that same homestay. And maybe they're, you know, maybe they feel like, well, this isn't what I expected, but whatever. I'm just going to go with the flow. And there's other things that are, I like being with the group. And so I'm going to like do that or, you know, these other things going on. It's not a very empowered mindset, but it's also not super negative. It's a little bit more kind of balanced and kind of going with the flow. The learner mindset is maybe this idea that this might be the only time in my life that I'm going to be in a homestay with two Guatemalan grandparents. So I'm going to make the most of that. And I'm going to, um, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to learn from this experience. I'm going to hear their stories. I'm going to practice my Spanish. I'm going to follow them in their daily rituals. Uh, you know, so it's all of these situations. It's the same homestay. It's the same circumstances. The only thing that has shifted is our mindset, is our response to those. So, you know, we're not trying to push people from the prisoner up to the learner. And I think like that's kind of a common misconception is that, is that, you always want to be in the learner state. It's not about that. It's about having awareness of our own power in a situation. And sometimes being a prisoner and being in that negative mind state, that's actually healthy and really good, a good thing too. So it doesn't mean that we should avoid that or that we're always kind of striving to be in the learner mindset. Uh, it just brings self-awareness about our own role in response to circumstances and, and ultimately lets us feel more empowered in that too. Explanatory styles. So looking at explanatory styles is, it's basically storytelling. So, you know, in the literature, they talk about negative explanatory styles and positive explanatory styles. And a negative, negative storytelling style is that when you face some kind of adversity, the explanation for why you face that adversity is that it's personalized, it's permanent, and it's pervasive. And so it's kind of the pessimistic uh, negative storytelling explanation. And so, you know, a, a example of, of that might be that um, it, if I have to give a school presentation 
and I, I'm, I'm a, as a teacher and I'm giving, our, we'll just say this webinar, I'm giving this webinar and I find that it really bombed. It just didn't go well and people, um, you know, it just, it just did not land. The material didn't land. So the negative explanation for that is I get off of this webinar and I tell myself, oh, you did a horrible job. Like you did such a bad job. It's your fault. So that's one is it, it's personalized. This is my fault. It's a personal failing of me that this webinar didn't go well. It's permanent. Not only did this webinar not go well, but you know, I'll never be able to do any of these kind of talks. They, they're always going to be bad. This isn't just about this one thing. It's about all of those things. And then it's pervasive. Not only was the webinar bad and that that won't ever be, be well, but I'm also, I'm just actually a really awkward communicator and it makes it really hard to connect with people. So now I've taken this one thing of this, you know, this one incident of a, a webinar that, that, that didn't go well. And that's now become this negative story that might actually define my identity in the world. It might actually limit my opportunities and really actually change um, what, what paths are open to me because of this story that I've just told myself about the webinar. So kind of on the opposite of that is this positive storytelling style is that you see these challenges are situational, they're transient and temporary, and they're controllable. So for the same webinar thing, the same the webinar bomb that didn't go well, I know that. But, you know, the story that I tell myself is actually, well, you know, I could have prepared better for the, I could have prepared better the material. Um, it, didn't, it didn't land as well with, oh, somewhere else. We're not needed. Um, sorry, hold on. I just need to figure out one thing here. Oh, hi, buddy. Um, so you know, it it didn't it didn't land well, but maybe that's a result of the audience or the the you know, not, not just on me. It's also the dynamic wasn't right. It was a weird format. There's these other things where it's, it's less just about a personal failing and more situational. Um, it's not permanent. Next time I could do a better job on the webinar. This isn't going to define me for the rest of my life. Like there's things that I could do, I could do better. And then it's not, it's not, perf it's not pervasive. It doesn't define my other reactions. So when we're thinking about these explanatory styles, it's, it's a really helpful check on, on the, what we consider to be these like objective capital T truths about the world. And we often find that our self perceptions are actually not totally accurate. So how do we actually go about switching, switching our story? Um, this is kind of a, a nice tool that, that I like. We're kind of getting into the practical tools here of, of just, you have an adversity, you have, a, you have a challenge, and you have a belief about that. And then that belief has these different consequences. So thinking of another homestay example, if you're, if you're at dinner with a, a, with a family in a foreign country, you don't know the cultural norms, and you're at dinner and you sit down to the table and everyone gets up and walks away as soon as you sit down. So that probably doesn't feel good. That's an adversity. It, 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 it's a challenge or struggle. Now the belief about that, on the negative storytelling, you might say, this family left because they didn't like me. Uh, not only they didn't like me, I'm actually not that likable. And not only not that likable, but I'll probably like never be able to have a good homestay experience or have like another interaction with people because I'm just awkward in those situations. So here you had this family left you at the table and now you have these beliefs and those beliefs have really real consequences. And if that's the story we're telling ourselves about that situation, that can really impact who, who we are in the world moving forward. So the idea is how do we dispute that narrative? How do we actually propose a counter narrative and looking for other types of evidence and alternatives that have different implications and usefulness for, uh, for our, our own lives. So, you know, in that situation, maybe, the reason why the family left is because in that culture, it's actually rude to watch someone else eat when you're not eating. So they wanted to give you privacy. Maybe they actually felt really shy and timid and they didn't know how to talk to you. 
Um, there's all kinds of other explanations that could be out there that are different than that original kind of negative story that might leave us feeling, you know, feeling so poor moving forward. So, uh, and then the final step of this kind of the, the ABCs is evaluate. So think about the beliefs and the consequences. See if you can kind of come up with other assumptions and, and explanations and poke hole, holes in that kind of negative story that kind of likes to take hold. And then evaluate what feels, you know, what, what feels actually realistic in, in your own life moving forward. Because we don't want to like delude ourselves into kind of always just telling these positive stories, but it's important to kind of evaluate if the stories we're telling ourselves are actually uh, serving us and accurate in the world. So you, for yourselves, thinking of a time that you had a setback and that you told yourself a story based on assumptions. And you know, maybe it's later today or tonight, practice using this model to try to switch that story. See if you can push yourself to, to find alternative narratives and explanations and try that on, evaluate how that feels and if that, there might actually be an angle to what that adversity that you hadn't previously considered. A couple of mindfulness tools, kind of back to the mindset. Um, and I love these, but savoring, which we talked about a little bit before, is this idea that our awareness of, of pleasure and um, happiness and joy in a moment, our deliberate awareness of it can actually increase it, amplify it, and make it more lasting. So the few ways that we can savor a moment are by sharing it with others. We know that sharing positive experiences helps those experiences be even experienced more intensely and also are la more lasting. Um, memory building. So taking a little picture, I'm not talking about like documenting the whole thing, but having a photo to come back to that moment. Uh, it could be a journal entry. It could be a, <clears throat> a souvenir or a little token that helps you remember that positive experience. Uh, ceremony and celebration is a great way to kind of memorialize positive experiences and, and make them more last lasting. And then, so those are just a few kind of ways that when we think about savoring. Basking is kind of, it's not as self-explanatory as a word, but basking is the idea that when you receive praise <clears throat> from another person, uh, a compliment or some kind of positive interaction, that you should bask in that and that you should actually let that seek in just like, just like the sunshine. So kind of think about like sunbathing in like a, a positive compliment or affirmation that you receive. And I think sometimes we're so quick to turn the negative story on those affirmations to disqualify them or not believe that they're true when, when really it's an opportunity for us to kind of bask in that and to let that seep into a different uh, kind of deeper part of ourselves. Oh, okay. Oh, well, we have a question here. How can positive psychology be implemented into negative circumstances? If you feel like, I'm just reading this question. How can positive psychology be implemented into negative circumstances? If you feel like a situation is negative, <laughs> How do you center yourself and make it into a more positive experience? That's a good question. I mean, I think it kind of coming back to that, that prisoner vacation or learner model, when we're in a negative experience, I don't think the first reaction should be just throw our hands up and say, Oh, this is just a mindset issue. Um, because you know, there, there's things that we can maybe do that can make that situation better, more comfortable, uh, more enjoyable for us. So I think we first have to explore where is the external um, power that we have to to improve a situation. So maybe there's actually things that we can be doing that can help us better align with our own happiness and make it more positive. Now, if they're in a place where that's not possible, then I think it kind of comes back to that awareness piece of thinking, well, where is my mindset? And what, what, what are ways I, I can imagine myself responding in this situation or acting in this situation that would, would feel better? That would just, I mean, like on a very simple level, what would like actually feel more enjoyable and feel more joyful for me in this moment? And it can be hard to do that sometimes when you're in a really negative situation. And, you know, when I'm talking about a negative situation, I'm not talking about something where 
where you know your safety is at risk that's a that's kind of a different thing i'm just talking about something that's maybe maybe challenging or not the most enjoyable moment um i think like right now when we're in maybe some of us are struggling in this kind of covid reality of trying to imagine what are the the moments in our lives that where we really felt happy and aligned in the in the in with ourselves and to actually kind of write some of those down and to kind of mark those and then that by articulating them can help us move those from something that's kind of an abstract feeling into more of like an actionable reality so it's really important to actually reflect and articulate into words because once we move it from a feeling into a, a more kind of tangible memory or experience then we can start to think about okay well how can i create that and like where you know is that possible to create that um so those are just a couple of things that come to mind about the implementation and we can we can talk more about that there's just a couple more slides and then we'll just open it up into questions actually in a, a moment once i wrap these up the i think there's actually just two more slides gratitude we have spoke about that flow uh, flow states there's i think flow is a really i've noticed that recently and in, in this covid reality is that it's really easy for me to fall into kind of mindless tasks whether that's like watching a series or reading a book or like just doing things that are not challenging for myself and that when i actually like push myself i've been trying to learn how to paint and so the more I've been painting, which I'm not good at, <laughs> but like I, I find it really absorb um, kind of this absorbing activity because it's challenging. And so flow is this idea of doing an activity where it's kind of at your threshold, where it requires concentration, uh, it requires kind of um, effort and involvement and absorption into the task. And that, that is actually the kind of hallmarks of a flow state. And so something that really requires that, that, that kind of bit of challenge. And then we can lose our sense of self and time in a task. And I know that's happened to me, like doing the painting is like, I'll do that and a few hours will go by. And it's like, whoa, I haven't checked my phone. I haven't, you know, I haven't like let my mind wander because I kind of entered this flow state. And for some of us that, you know, that happens with physical pursuits, uh, running or playing sports or, playing music or things like that are other ways of kind of going into these flow states. And then the last one there is marveling. And this is kind of, this is a one minute video that I just love to show. It's uh, actually from a radio lab podcast about extreme happiness. And this is a guy, uh, and this is actually, I think our last, last slide. Uh, this is a this is a Norwegian explorer who he did I think he was about three months or maybe five months I can't remember but this is day 84 of completely alone in the wilderness um, and he's crossing the North Pole by himself and so he's left these little caches of of supplies um, you know like fuel and medical supplies and things and he's GPS them and so he's he's left those in advance and now he's kind of he doesn't even remember what's there so this is him uncovering one of those caches and i love this because this idea of marveling is marvel is marvel at the world and find awe and wonder in in the small things in the world and i think this video kind of demonstrates that it's just a minute long and then we'll kind of wrap up <laughs> Extra trucks to my cup, no extra picked up. Oh, I tanked it. Why are they ever locked in a die? It's a chocolate bar. I think I'm going to take the produce part back to the eye. We can move it. Uh, I love that video.
video so much because I can't watch it without smiling. And I think that's kind of goes to this whole point about happiness being contagious. And, um, you know, I think you see someone else smiling and, you, and, and it makes you want to smile. And so, you know, I love that, that video because it kind of is exuberance in the small things of life. This is the, the last slide. And I wanted to end with this because I think for me, it's one of the most easiest things to implement is just to practice more gratitude in your life whether that is thinking about things you're grateful of and or or actually expressing those but i love this quote from robert emmons who's a psychologist who studies gratitude and he says gratitude is acknowledgement of goodness in one's own life in gratitude we say yes to life we affirm that all things have taken together life is good and has elements that make it worth living the acknowledgement that we have received something gr gratifies us either by its presence or by the effort to the giver went to uh, the giver went into in choosing it. Second, gratitude is recognizing that the sources of this goodness lie at least partially outside of the self. The object of gratitude is other directed. Thanks are directed outward to the giver of gifts. Grateful people are more energetic, emotionally intelligent forgiving and less likely to be depressed anxious or lonely and i just love this idea that we feel gratitude often and appreciation but to actually express that and turn it into an action is one of the kind of easiest switches that we can make in our lives of just when we feel gratitude to share that with the person um, to share that appreciation in the moment or to note it and to celebrate it and to savor it um, you know, so one activity that you all could do on your own is to imagine someone that has positively impacted your life and, and you've never really told them that. You've never expressed gratitude. You could write them a letter. You can give them a call. And this could be someone that is no longer on this earth, has, has passed away. And you could still uh, experience those kind of same positive emotions and safe feelings by, by writing that letter and going through that practice, even if you never, that person never gets to see it. So that's kind of the end of the, of the presentation there. And um, I'm going to stop sharing that screen and come back here. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or if people can, if they want to unmute themselves and like ask a question or type it, but happy to, to chat about anything that we talked about in the last hour or so. Aaron, I have a question. Yeah. Um, hi. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like, I'm trying to think about the balance between like having a positive mindset, but then drawing the line at like, avoiding negative emotions because I think there's um, sometimes this tendency also to like be positive all the time and I think there's also an importance in like sitting with um, and like allowing yourself to feel the like painfulness and things and just be like this is okay and I'm just gonna sit with it rather than avoid it but given like your experience with um the literature, but also just in your own life. Could you talk a little about like where that balance is and like once, I mean, what's the difference between like sitting with pain and then like wallowing in it, you know? Mm. Yeah. It's, it's a really, it's a, it's a great question. And I think it's, it's like all good questions. There's no one answer to it. I think, you know, it's like the mark of a good question is that there's no simple answer. And I, I mean, one of the reasons why I want to start off with the idea of of suffering as part of life and adversity as part of life and positive psychology doesn't mean turning your back on that, right? And I think, I, I guess like for me, it would be tapping into that sense of, is there still learning or or processing that's going on in this pain in this in staying in this moment and this what like you said kind of wallowing in it but like you know that's that's completely necessary and and helpful moments but kind of asking ourselves do i feel like this is still um 
this is helping me move towards something or am I stuck in a way that like I'm stuck in this kind of place of inertia where it's a, where it's circular where I'm just coming back to the same tape and the same messages and it's like oh you know what this feels really familiar like this is actually I'm not actually spiraling I'm just I'm just in a circle and so like I think you know a spiral you think of it as actually moving up into something else and so through that grief and pain you're actually slowly making some progress to maybe different realizations. And that doesn't mean that the pain goes away or the suffering goes away, but that you're, you're maybe still moving in some kind of direction. And I think when you feel this kind of deep stuckness, then I think then it's time to actually try to really move out of that. And maybe that for some people that might actually, you know, take outside forces to break that inertia. Um, but that's like kind of my initial response is that, when it's no longer serving us in the long term. And I think we have to take the long view because obviously if you're just looking at the moment, then everyone's gonna to wanna to avoid suffering because it doesn't feel as good. It's like, well, I wanna do something that feels better. <laughs> but uh, the benefit for that is in the long run. Um, and, and I think it's kind of just knowing intuitively and also trusting people around, around you, right? Like when you have people that you really love and that know you well and that you trust, that are saying like, hey, you know, like, this feels like the same thing. You, I'm worried about you because I feel like you're stuck in this place. And I think that kind of sense of stuckness is when it's time to, to, to really look at different, different directions. So. Sweet. Thanks. Thanks, Al. That was a great question. Anyone else have other other questions or, or comments or anything that came up for you during the presentation? Um, feel feel free to to unmute or to, to type into the chat. I don't know if this is going to be a fully articulated question, but I just kind of wanted to put out there this idea, especially like being in the coronavirus right now and trying to find rhythms to like feel comfortable and where we are now. But at least for me personally, I think one thing that kind of helps me through is like, oh, well, you know, like in a couple months, maybe things will like go back to normal. And in a sense, I think sometimes I like will kind of like put my happiness on that idea of like, returning to normalcy or you know something in the future is going to make me like happier and I was just wondering if you could quickly touch on like is you know maybe like what are the issues with that and like what are some healthier ways if that is an unhealthy way of kind of getting yourself excited or being more positive to you know feel more content in where you are now yeah I think everyone I'm sure can relate to that because it's a, such a common human experience to, to be, to just be thinking about the future and, or, or other realities, other possibilities that are outside of where we are currently. And I think you're absolutely right that we're all feeling that probably right now, even more acutely. Uh, there's a really good book called Stumbling on Happiness by Daniel Gilbert. And he has a great, a couple great YouTube TED Talks and videos that are short, like 10 to 20 minutes, where you can kind of really get a lot of his thesis, thesis, thesis. But he talks about how the human brain is like the most advanced future simulator. <laughs> like what it's, it's constantly simulating future scenarios and alternative scenarios and imagining what they look like and what they feel like. And what he finds in his research is that it's, we're really bad at it. And so often what we're imagining of how the future will feel or how a different moment will feel, um, when we get to that moment, it's, it's, not, it's not accurate. And one interesting finding is that when we think about something that we're dreading in the future and when that happens, it's usually much worse than we had imagined it. So we kind of tend to overestimate pain and suffering in the future, um, which kind of is in line with what we know about the negativity bias. And the corollary of that is that when we think about a positive experience in the future, we tend to underestimate how that will feel too. 
so the takeaway for me is that our our visions of the future are 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 just they're just inaccurate and they're and they're just they're like flights of imagination and so while they can be fun to engage i think it's important for us to kind of step back and know that they're not real in the sense of the same realness of our surroundings um which which that the mood that we're in the surroundings the physical surroundings the emotional surroundings that we're in those are really the only real things that we can say because this the future is totally unpredictable in, in both the, the external circumstances and realities of it but also how we're going to feel in those moments and so i think kind of coming back to to the present um and not being upset with ourselves for taking those mental flights and i think sometimes we can we can be our harshest critics and so like it, it could be we're so quick to kind of like chastise ourselves for like oh i'm not i should be more present i should be doing this and i think it's it's fine to take those those flights into the future but then also to kind of come back and to actually keep that perspective of like yeah but that's not that's not real and what can i do to engage this this moment right here or or these surroundings here um and not let the future uh become kind of um a distraction or safety valve of like distracting us from where we are uh, when there's maybe a lot of things that can bring us enjoyment in, the, in our present surroundings so that's kind of just what comes to mind it's a, it's a great question You mentioned healthy habit formation, and I'm wondering what you think based on the literature and also just personal experience, like how, how one can find a balance between like having positive habits and routines that also allow space for spontaneity and like a willingness for things to go off the, the track of like what was expected. Yeah. I, yeah, the the extreme of habit formation is rigidity, right? And right. I think we've we've all seen or experienced ourselves that you know the person that like has to have like when they get up they have to have things this way and then they have to do this and you know if you go to the far extreme you can be living in a way that's actually not very resilient and so the healthy habits are are meant to to amplify the parts of ourselves that we want to amplify to make us put us in a positive state to be living healthy to be living happily but uh the habits while they amplify it it's not actually it's not actually the the core of what the happiness is those are things that maybe help us get there but it's like it's it's not the actual the goal you know and i think we can confuse the habits for the goal and the goal is is actually a, a stable sense of well-being that's resilient and that uh, you know that that can can respond to the different adversity that we face in life and i think what i'm reminded of of thinking of that is there's this great buddhist parable of uh <clears throat> this monk who is pointing at the sky and all of his disciples are looking at his his finger and they're studying what is the position of his finger mean and you know why is he like holding his arm this way and they're they're all analyzing his body position and he basically turns and says what are you idiots doing don't look at me i'm look at the moon i'm pointing at the moon you know and so like confusing the habits for the moon which is like really what like that's what we're trying to get and so um i'd say just not being too attached to those things and knowing like okay these habits work for me and that's great but you know what like maybe it's good to kind of shake them up sometimes too and to and to introduce that so that we don't you know we don't become too dependent on one routine or one ritual and also knowing that we have to make room in our lives for other people too whether that's friends or partners or family members um that that our our habits are are not just about us that they're situated in a community and a you know with our with our neighbors so thank you <laughs> thanks <laughs> any other any other questions out there
Well, you all can can email me if you ever want to connect, but uh, it's great. Oh, Annika. <laughs> awesome. I didn't even know. <laughs> no, it's so great to see see all these familiar names and faces. Um, thanks so much for attending, everyone. We'll kind of wrap it up so people can, can be on their way. And um, Oh, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate that. And um, yeah, I hope to, to be in touch. And like I said, you can always, for more information or, or, or resources, feel free to, to shoot me an email. I'm always happy to kind of share more about, obviously, this is kind of a bit of a, a overview survey, but can point you in direction for other things as well. And sometimes questions and comments and things take time to percolate as well. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Great to see you all. Um, and yeah, Jan, shoot me an email and I can send you some, some books for sure. Uh, probably easier to do that over email with authors and stuff. All right, everyone. Great to see you. Thanks, Aaron. Take care. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> Be Thank safe, Aaron. everyone. <laughs> Thanks.